Hello, today I am going to be talking about zebrafish. We're going to be looking at some of their brain anatomy and we're going to be looking at some behavioral assays. First, we're going to be looking at some of their basic zebrafish brain anatomy. Um, we're looking at the top view of their head here. Uh, we see the telencephalon, um, TEL. This is homologous to the limbic system. And then we have the optic septum behind that um, TEO. And that is a visual processing area. It's very large due to the fact that they are a highly visual species. And then behind the optic septum is the cerebellum. And that is homologous to the mammalian cerebellum. Um, here in panel A, you can see uh, these head bars. Uh, right behind the optic tectum and the cerebellum. I'm going to have you remember that because we're going to talk about that later in the study by Huang K et al. in 2020. Then I'll be here just looking at the skull bone structure above each of those brain areas. So it's on the optic and the cerebellum behind that. Here we are looking at a wide field fluorescent image of an adult zebrafish head. You can kind of see their brain through their skull and their skin. Um, and it's like right here behind their eyes. Um, B is a zoomed in image uh, of just one and a half of the color. So you have the midline across. And then we have the DM, which is the medial bone of the telencephalon. It's sort of homologous to our basolateral amygdala. We have the RDC and the CDC, which is the, they're both a part of the central zone of the dorsal telencephalon. We have the dorsal rostral area and the dorsal caudal area. Apparently, the, these areas together are homologous to the isocortex or the neocortex. Of, there's a lot of sensory perception, generation of motor commands, and spatial learning that's happening here. Then we have the DL, um, that's the lateral zone of the dorsal hippocampus, and that is potentially, oh, of the telencephalon, and that's potentially related to the hippocampus. So next, we are gonna be looking at different um, brain areas that are mapped out in hunting behaviors. Um, and the different activation of uh, neurotransmitters uh, in those behaviors. Hunting behavior in zebrafish happens in two sort of stages. There's the exploitation phase and the exploration phase. Exploitation is very vocalized, really jagged swimming, um, and that's like they are going to attack their prey. Um, sorry, I'll take the call off that. I can call back later. Um, and then we have the exploration phase, which is enhanced spatial movement. So they're more exploratory, they're moving around more of the less precise movement. Um, hunting happens um, in a certain sequence, which is a sequence of behavior. We have eye convergence. Their eyes are sort of coming together, they're targeting in, and then they visual, they have their prey in their visual field. So their eyes are moving inward. It's not cross-eyed, but almost. And then they visualize their prey, and then they have the expectation state where they are moving around in really precise in a really precise manner. And then we have success where they catch their prey and then it's really exciting because they're eating their food. The, um, the eye convergence, you can see activation in the hind brain and hind brain and cerebellum areas. We see a lot of acetylcholine being dumped in those areas. And then we have the visualization of prey. We also, um, in their visual field, and we see acetylcholine in the optic tectum, which makes sense. We see Prey, this is a stimulus, off the spectrum, it's activated. And then three, we have the exploitation phase for this um, state, and we see a lot of serotonin in the dorsal raft nucleus. This makes sense because that is associated with arousal and the modulation of sensory input. And then four, we have success. Um, dopamine is released in the locus coeruleus and Serotonin is dumped in the high brain. It's a really rewarding thing. They're getting to eat. How exciting, how fun. Um, just a really fun side note about their brains before we move on to talking about behavioral assays. Um, their brains are relatively regenerative. Um, no, not relatively. They are regenerative. Um, this is something that some neuroscientists would argue happens to some capacity in, in mammals, but that's really controversial. 
in zebra fish, it's not like it's a fact. They can um, there's an injury that happens, and then within like 30 days of injury, their brain heals, regrows um, without a scar. Um, like they have a brand new brain, and I think that's really cool. And I didn't find a figure that I liked to express that, but I thought it was important to include. So now we are going to be looking at um, different behavioral assays for zebra fish. And if you remember the head bars from our first slide, they're coming into play here. The head bar is holding our little zebra fish in place in a circle, and it's like arena to virtual reality. Quite cool, quite fun. Um, we know that zebra fish will respond to images of predators, they'll respond to images of prey, they'll respond to different changes in environment. And Pongke et al. was just looking at the behavioral, like the changes in behavior, they were taking the videos, like whether or not they were freezing, whether they were uh, like moving around agitated, or whether they were calm, and they were looking at changes in calcium signaling. There's all sorts of cool stuff going on here with these virtual reality cameras. I think the reality is that like most labs do not have the funding to really use virtual reality. Um, and I think it's a really cool display of like what's up and coming, but I don't think it's really practical in terms of labs that have zebra fish that want to do behavioral assays. Um, and that's like not, I, they just don't have the funding for that. So I wanted to look at different um, behavioral assays that don't rely on lots of expensive technology. And I found this researcher up in Canada, his name's Richard Berlai, and it was his associate. They, back in 2011, looked at the plus names. I really like uh, Dr. Gerlai. He is a behavioral neuroscientist looking at genetic manipulation, no, not genetic manipulation, but he's looking at um, genetic phenotypes for different like anxiety behaviors. He's also looking at um, like alcohol dependence in zebra fish. He also he looks at some sorry, he looks at some um, whatever. It's okay. He um, oh he looks at mammal models too as well. But he wanted to use the plus maze that's traditionally used for rats on, and to see if it was effective on zebra fish. He paired a red cue card with a um, he paired a red cue card with the reward, and he placed the red cue card with the reward in the same art every time for the paired group. The unpaired group, the red cue card was placed um, randomly, and it wasn't associated with the reward. Um, panel A here is talking about how they um, show it's within their first training period, and there's not a difference between the paired and the unpaired um, for the amount of time that they spent in their target arm. In the training condition, we see, or in the probe, this is the probe trial on panel B, we see that there's an unpaired and a paired. And they, um, the paired condition, where they had the stimulus associated with a certain region, they spent more time hanging out where the reward was, where the unpaired group didn't spend as much time with the reward. And, Panel C for our last panel over here, we're looking at the frequency of target arm visits relative to the total number of arm visits between the paired and the unpaired. So the number of times that they're crossing over to an arm, whether it's uh, whether it is the target arm or not the target arm with the reward in it. You see that there's not a significant difference. So panel B suggests that there might be significant difference between the paired and unpaired group and remembering where the reward is. But with this final figure over here on the last panel, we're seeing that they are kind of searching. They don't really remember where the reward is. They um, are a visual species. And so he postulates that perhaps they were spending more time because they saw the key card uh, and they wanted to hang out with the key card. But it was only after they had looked around a few times to find it. Um, he also was really cool. He wanted to. Um, just like rats, um, zebra fish can smell, and he wanted to control for that. So, like in the plus maze for rats, he would like wipe it down. What he did was he put food in every arm, so the but only had the reward available in one. So the smell was kind of diffused, and they couldn't use the smell to kind of find the reward. 
he determined that the plus maze was sort of effective, but not really in the plant spatial memory, learning and memory. So in 2012, he published another study looking for um, a way to assess spatial learning and memory. He, um, Gerlai found that fish get really, really excited when they see a friend of their own species. These are called um, conspecifics. And he used this as a form of rewarding stimulus um, and acute dependent classical condition paradigm. And he wanted to apply this finding, this the fact that like seeing the friend is rewarding to investigate spatial um, learning memory. So here we're looking at an open field tank, um, the striped regions represent like a tank within a tank. So you can kind of see that in panel A over here. Um, the black region represents, that's like where the target is. So you the cue card and the con specific in that area or the paired group and that's the target region. Uh, and then the gray areas just represent the other um, target regions that he would assess. And then the white areas are kind of blind spots where they wouldn't be able to see the cue or the conspecifics due to like reflection of the glass in the tank. So we're looking at the probe trial in our graph over here. And we're looking at the percent of time that they spent in the target zone. And so we have a cue where they put the cue card up and then the no cue card. Um, and then we have the pair, so he has the font specific queued with the red cue card, and then you have the not paired group where it was the card and the font specific in the application. And you can see for the cue card trial and the no cue card trial, both the pair groups do significantly better than are not paired, but are still doing that sort of a control. So this model is a really good way of assessing spatial learning memory. We do see that with the no cue card, the, um, the fish remember the last time where they saw their friend, which is really cool. It's really exciting. Um, I really like the study. Uh, it was fun to read. Um, Zebrafish have, as we, as we discussed earlier, they really like seeing their friends. And because of that, they've been recently established in studying social behavior. Um, some really cool facts about that is that they do not require parental care like other species. Um, and parental care can be a kind of variable in uh, other models. We also know that zebrafish are easily controlled for these manipulations, like genetic manipulations, or uh, with different drugs or things like that. We also see that in their first week, they have really good uh, avoidance behavior, um, which is easily observed in their brain areas because their brains are not fully developed at that point. So it's easy to identify what regions are responsible for this avoidance behavior that's happening. We also know that their behavior um, is really discrete. Their swim bouts are measurable for quantification, um, which makes them a good model for studying social behavior. Um, this setup here gives us a four-shaped tank where the fish um, are placed. And then there's two chambers on each side of the of the um, horse shoe shape. Um, we see that they have a sort of habituation period where they're placed in there without any contraceptives, and then they have another period where the contraceptives are placed in and want to see if they have a preference for the side with the contraceptive friends to say hello. You see that in one week old test fish, they don't really have a preference. They don't really care whether or not their friends are there. They spend equal amount of time in both areas. The three week old fish are a little bit more mature and they decide they want to have some friends. And they actually really like spending time around the con specific and they have a preference for that side. Um, and this is image with the camera sitting above the, the sort of tank um, watching this happen. In panel C here, they wanted to make sure that they were actually looking at the fish and that was like actually what was going on because they're really visual species. And so it's important to know whether or not they were just spending time over there because they wanted to spend time over on that side or if it was because they saw their fish friends. And so we have this like sort of circle representing like which way their head is facing. And in the first week, we kind of see like a little cross shape. So they're facing kind of all sorts of different directions in the area with the con specifics. And then two weeks, we see it kind of round out a little bit more. They're spending a little bit more time looking at the, at the con specifics. And week three, we see it very localized. They're looking 
they're using one eye or the other to look at the um, to look at their friends, which is seen with the 45 degree angle they're coming this way or this way. What's really cool is they really big one of stuff, whether or not this is due to the fact that they were visually seeing their friends. And so they had the acclimation period and they had the dark period. And the dark period um, resulted in similar results to the acclimation phase. They were spending equal amount of time on both sides of the horseshoe. Whereas when you turn the lights on, they saw their friend and they swam over and they spent more time in the light side. They also, what they did, you can see is that they took the contact sticks in the other, uh, and the other, on the other side, like you had them in the top the first time, now we have them in the bottom. They wanted to make sure that they weren't like remembering where their friends were. They wanted to make sure that it was actually their friends, which is why you see a little bit more hanging out in the top. These fish might have remembered that their friends were there in the first, in the first pile. And they have the visual fields um, assessment again, where they have, uh, they have the plus size. And so they're looking in all directions in the dark. They don't know where to look but in the light you see that same 45 45 sort of visual field going on um so it's really cool we know that we can use fish to look at uh say, social behavior this study or this is a communication based off the study um that was in response to go covid 19 and the isolation that was happening back in march and in the summertime it was published in october actually they were looking to see like the effect of social isolation on the development of the zebrafish and like the behaviors that result from it. Um, fish have a sort of a personal space and in normally raised fish, it's rather close to them, but fish that were raised in social isolation had a larger so it's like um, personal bubble basically. And they had less tolerance for other fish coming into that larger personal bubble and they had this avoidance behavior that was matched with it. Um, and so it just raises some interesting questions about what COVID-19 is going to be doing to people. Um, are we going to be avoiding people more? Like, are we going to be more uncomfortable around people? It also raises some interesting questions about maybe like the kids that were supposed to be like pre-K, kindergarten, first grade, um, how the isolation is going to affect them. It also raises some interesting questions about homeschool kids and um, how they interact with the world not that they were raised um not near other people as much um so i don't know it's really interesting i thought that was a really cool communication and a good way to finish out this presentation thank you for listening and thank you yeah i guess i should ask if there's any questions but there's nobody to ask questions so <laughs> bye <laughs> Ooh. thank you oh it's still going